Praise the Lord. Glory, 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 hallelujah. Wonderful, merciful, glorious, and gracious is our God. And we give him the praise and we give him the glory because he's a good God, he's a great God, he's a mighty God. And we cannot but appreciate him for his mercies of our lives, his kindness and his goodness, his compassion and his faithfulness. And we give him the glory in the name of Jesus. So thank you once again, viewers all over the world for joining me on this World Room broadcast as we conclude today on the series of the topic, are you in church or in a cage? And indeed, you will agree with me that there are churches or seemingly looking churches who are clearly a cage for God's people. And if you are in such a church, if you cannot, by the grace of God, create a new order and a change in that church to make it a Bible-believing, Bible-living, and Bible-preaching church, it will be important for your soul and your eternal life to get out of that church and look for a new place where the truth of scriptures is being taught. And um, as we round off this series today, I will be teaching on the topic, idols in the church. Idols in the church. You know, the first of the 10 commandments of the almighty God in Exodus chapter 20, I think that's two or three. It says, you shall have no other gods beside me. You shall have no other gods beside me. And that commandment, Jesus came to validate it, to fulfill it, and to establish it as the all-time commandment of the Almighty to us as mankind. But unfortunately, there are several gods that people have invented in the name of Jesus and in the name of the church. And they are worshiping these gods and it's idolatry in the sight of the almighty God. Let us pray. Precious Father, we thank you for you have been so good to us as a people called by your name. And Lord, we thank you for the revelation of your truth that you are bringing to us through this World Room broadcast. And Lord, we pray that tonight, as we share on the topic, idols in the church, you will open our understanding. You will grant us an entrance of your light and of your truth, and our lives will be better even by it, and your name will be glorified. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, we pray. I'd like to start by reading again one of our main texts in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 17. I'll read verse 16, and then we'll jump to verse 22 to 24, and then we'll take the rest up from there. Acts chapter 17, I'm reading first verse 16, and then I'll read verse 22 to 24. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. The city of Ephesus, where Paul was ministering here, was given over to idols. Idolatry became the order of the worship 
of the people in Athens. That's 22 to 24. Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. You are very superstitious. You are so committed to religious tenets, but not according to the will of God. He said, for as I was passing through and considering the objects, I'd like you to take note of that, objects of your worship. I even found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship, I declare unto you. The one whom you worship, I declare unto you. God, who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. Paul saw the city given over to idolatry. And amazingly, there were different altars where the people congregate to worship. And to them, they were worshiping the almighty God, the true God, the God of the heavens and the earth. But because they do not really know him, they were worshiping idols, believing or thinking or assuming that they were worshiping the almighty God. And you see, assumptions is the mother of all delusion. A lot of people are in a cage assuming they were in a church. A lot of people are worshiping idols unknowingly in the name of a church. And that assumption is very costly. Now you see, the church is God's established family to shepherd his people. Our work, therefore, in the church and as shepherds of God's people is primarily to help the people to conform to the image of the Almighty, of Christ, who is the Word. The work of the church is primarily and principally to help the people conform to Christ, conform to the word. And listen, when people follow an unknown God, when people serve an unknown God, when people commit themselves to an unknown God and they begin to worship an idol, in the name of worshiping the true God. Second Kings chapter 17 and verse 41 tells us clearly what could happen to them. Second Kings, I read chapter 17. Let me read first verse 15. Second Kings 17 and verse 15. It says, and they rejected his statutes and his covenant that he had made with their fathers. And then they followed idols and they became idolaters and went after the nations who were all around them, concerning whom the Lord had charged them that they should not do like them. 
Hallelujah. Now, let me read that same statement in the Amplified Translation. He said, and they followed vanity, false gods, falsehood, emptiness, and futility, and they themselves and their prayers became false, empty, and fertile. It's a tragedy to be in a cage thinking you are in a church. It's a tragedy to invariably be worshiping an idol in the guise of worshiping the true God. For you will always become like the one you worship. You will always become like the one you follow. And when we are in a true church and we are worshiping the true God, we will ultimately be transformed into the image of the God we worship. Corinthians tells us, 2 Corinthians 3.18, we all with open face be holding as in a glass the image of the living God are being transformed into the same image we are beholding from one level of glory to the other. And here in 1 Kings 17.15, we could see that when you follow an idol, in the name of following the true God, you are ultimately going to become an idolater. Your worship and your prayer is going to be empty and fertile and without any reference to Almighty God because it won't bring glory to God. Hallelujah. You see, once scripture is held supreme, Identity crisis in and of the church will be eliminated. Once we hold scripture as supreme and sacred in our life, in our practice, in our teaching, there will be no identity crisis. The whole world will know that we are of God, that we are of Christ that we are of the way. That was what happened in the book of Acts of the Apostles when the disciples were called Christians. The people of the day could see their life in accurate conformity to Christ. So there was no identity crisis. They called them Christians. There was no identity crisis concerning these folks. It is only when scripture is violated that identity crisis becomes the norm. Hallelujah. And you see Jesus as king rules his kingdom by his word. He rules the kingdom by what the king has commanded. The kingdom of God is ruled, is governed by what the king has commanded. And so the only way to do ministry or church and to do it right is to do it biblically in conformity with scriptures. Once ministry is done biblically, is done scripturally, identity crisis is over. And the only way by which a church can become a cage is when it is not done in conformity with the word is when it is not wrong in conformity with the word. Failure to do church 
biblically makes the church a cage. Failure to run a church biblically, according to the New Testament ordinance, make the church a cage and not a church. In Psalm 119, verse 160, Psalm 119, verse 160, scripture says, particularly the A part, it says, your words all add up to the sum total fruit. That's from the message translation. Your words all add up to the sum total fruit. 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 And you see, Isaiah 66, verse 1 and 2, paraphrasing, he said, to this man will I look. To this church will I have respect. Will I have regard. To this church will I endorse with my glory and my presence the church, the life, the believer, the pastor that trembles at my word. The word trembles there means reverence. The word trembles there means honor. So does the church you attend honor the word of God as sacred? Or they honor the word of the pastor above the word of God? Does the church you go reverence the word of God above the words of men? That is how to know a church that is a true church or a gathering that is a cage in the name of a church. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 10 and 11, read it again from the message translation. God was clearly saying to the world by the mouth of the prophet Samuel that the only way a man, a church, a believer can be accounted as truly following him. And you see, the word follower is simply the word a disciple. And the work of the church is to make disciples of all nations. And so 1 Samuel 15, verse 10 and 11 in the message translation says, then God spoke to Samuel, I am sorry I ever made Saul king. And then the next statement says, he has turned his back on me. He has turned his back on me. And what made God say Saul has turned his back on him? The next statement, he refuses to do what I tell him. He refuses to do what I tell him. So when a church is not biblical, is not scriptural, the church has turned its back against God and has become a cage. When a believer, when a pastor no longer obeys what God says, follow what God says, rules his church by what God says, such a church, such a pastor, such a believer has turned his back on God and is no longer a church. It's a cage. And as I close this teaching, there are four primary issues that God regards as idolatry. There are four primary idols that the church of today worships, that the church of today holds more sacred than they own the word of God. And that makes such a church a cage and not a true church where Christ is honored. So what are these four primary idols that the church of today worships? Number one, 
buildings. Buildings. You heard me right. Buildings. Oh, pastor, are you saying that we shouldn't congregate in a building? Are you saying we shouldn't worship in a building? Are you saying buildings are not essential? Absolutely not. I'm preparing to build a sanctuary where we worship the Lord. But listen, when the building, the physical building becomes more important than the living stones, than the only temple of the body of the people, when the building becomes what we glory in, above the lives in which the Holy Ghost is living, when the physical building becomes more important to us than the vessels, than the acting vessels in which God wants to pour himself, pour his grace, pour his love and his power, such a church that holds the building most sacred has become an idol. Matthew chapter 24. I read verse 1 and 2. Matthew 24 and verse 1 and 2. Wow. Listen, friends. Jesus is very particular and meticulous about the lives he came to die for above every other thing. He said, the life of a man does not consist in the abundance of things, things, things. Now listen to Matthew 24, verse 1 and 2. He said that Jesus went out and departed from the temple. And his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, do you not see all these things? Now, you, you need to quickly understand what's happening here. They were showing Jesus a temple. Jesus was showing them things. Jesus was saying to them, Jesus didn't call the building a temple. He called it things. You must understand that. Number two. Jesus had gone out of this building. He had departed from this building. And then people are still showing him what he has gone out from. What he has departed from. Listen, there are many places we call temples of worship today. But Jesus has gone out of the place. Jesus has departed from the place. And people are still celebrating the building. Yet, the God of the building had left. He had departed. He's gone out of the place. He's standing at the door of the place, knocking, praying that the people will open up for him to come in afresh into their midst. And so Jesus departed from the place. And there we are now showing him the buildings of the temple. But Jesus was referring to what they call temples. Jesus was referring to it as things. Things. That tells you clearly that there is something that has shifted. There is a dichotomy. The people see it as temple. Jesus saw it as things. Why is it so? Because the people are celebrating the glory of the physical building more than they are celebrating the Christ, who is the God of the building. And today we glory in buildings. We glory in the largest cathedral in the world. We glory in the fastest growing church of the world. When are we going to start glorying in the fastest glory, glo growing believers that we are raising, rather than the buildings we are raising. When the building replaces the true temple of God, which are the human vessels God seeks to raise, that building has become an idol. 
And Jesus said to them, not one stone of these things you are talking about will remain on another. The stones will remain. The physical stones will remain. But the lively stones in whom Jesus wants to live and manifest himself to the world, they will live forever. So when we glory in the physical buildings, above the spiritual temples God is raising, that building has become an idol. And many believers today are still glorying much more in the physical buildings above the spiritual temples, the living stones that God is raising. Oh, come to my church. We have the largest building in the world. If you see the, the ambience of our church, all of that is good. But is the God of the temple still in that temple? And are we giving his word the primary place? So buildings can become an idol. And when the building has become an idol, it has transited from being a church, it has become a cage. Because if the building is an idol, everything done there is idolatry. And it is not going to bring glory to the almighty God. Number two, as people, people can become idols. And when I talk about people, it could come in different forms and shades. When people are being deified, when people are being celebrated above the God that they represent to us, such people have become idols. Do you know there are places where they celebrate the great man of God above the great God of the man? Do you know there are places where people will kneel down some meters away before they get to the man of God to greet him? But they have not bent their knees in worship and in honor of the almighty God. Do you know there are places where people who have means, who have money, who have positions or status in the society are so celebrated that they can no longer be corrected with the truth of scriptures, even when they go wrong, because we have deified them. We celebrate them. We hold them so sacred because of what they represent to us, either in terms of money, in terms of influence, in terms of position. Do you know that some leaders of churches and men of God have turned themselves to gods before the people? They even print their pictures and ask the people to hold it when they pray so that God can answer. I don't know what God they're talking about. Some people even ask their members to pray in their name. The God of so and so, arise and help me. And they will have scriptures to quote. Elisha, after all, pray. Where is the Lord God of Elijah? But listen, there is only one name that has been given to us in this dispensation. And that is the name Jesus Christ. That's the only name heaven recognizes. That's the only name that brings glory to heaven right now. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 14, I read from verse 11. Acts 14, from verse 11. And let's see an example of how men could become idols in the church by virtue of the influence, the power, the miracles, the signs and wonders that God is doing through their lives. It is easy when God is using a man of God for you to begin to deify him and see him as God. Acts 14, I read verse 11 and I read to 18. 
Now, when the people saw what Paul had done, they raised their voices, saying in the Lyconian language, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. And Barnabas, they called Zeus, and Paul, they called Ames, because he was the chief speaker. Then the priest of Zeus, whose temple was in front of their city, brought oxen and gallants to the gates, intending to sacrifice with the multitudes. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard this, they tore their clothes and ran in among the multitude, crying out and saying, Men and brethren, why are you doing these things? We also are men with the same nature as you and preach to you that you should turn from these useless things to the living God who made the heaven and the earth, the sea and all things that are in them. Hallelujah. Praise God. Did you see that? The moment Paul and Barnabas performed the miracle, a supernatural act of God, the people see them as God. The people deify them. The people wanted to start worshiping them. What you see, sometimes ago, I related with someone and Somehow, for a little while, I couldn't reach him. We, we, we just lost contact. And then he sent me a message. He said, Pastor Biodo, I just want to confirm if you are still in relationship with me and if you still regard me as your covering. And he placed the word covering in capitalized letters. And when I saw that, I said, what? God forbid, the Almighty is my covering. I may relate with you as a mentor. You may even be my father in the faith. That does not make you my covering. God is my covering. And listen, we have used these things, like Paul said, to keep the people in the cage, to keep the people in, 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 in a bondage. If you don't pay your tithe, your covering is not certain. If you don't give prophet offering, if you don't bring a sacrifice, if you don't bring the gallant, your covering is not in place. And a lot of people are being fooled as they are being caged by these things. Men, people can become idols that we worship in the church. Number three, because of my time. Is your service. You see, our service to God, God wants us to serve him, to labor and honor him and do all the best we could in his house to keep the house running and going and to keep the kingdom service activated. But listen, when you begin to see your service to God as your passport to anything you can get in God, so anything God should do for you, friends, that has become an idol. I have had people, people will quote Ezekiah. Ezekiah turned to the Lord and said, Lord, remember, I have served in your house. The preachers have preached it. I also have preached it. And people will turn to Nehemiah and say, Nehemiah prayed and said, remember me for good, O oh Lord, for all the good I've done for your house. Yes, but listen, whenever you own anything as your merit card before the Lord and before his throne, as a New Testament believer, you are certainly in idolatry. The only merit we have today is Christ and his sacrifice on the cross of Calvary. Not your service, not your money, not your commitment, nothing. You are doing all to the glory of God. And what else should you do 
for the price Christ has paid over your head. Don't you know you are a slave? And that you have been bought with a price? And the price is the life blood of Jesus Christ. So what merit do you have to claim before me? In Luke chapter 18, reading from verse 9, Luke chapter 18, reading from verse 9. Hallelujah. Glory to God forever. Also he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. They trusted in themselves that they were righteous. And he spoke this parable and despised others. He said, two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Amen. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus within himself. God. God. You see, we like to use God to accomplish our idolatrous purposes. God, I thank you that I am not like the other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And he was reeling out his merit card. He was reeling out his CV as though God does not know what he's done. And the tax collector, standing afar off, will not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, sinner. I tell you this, this man went down to his house, justified, rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself will be humble, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So you see, our service can become our idolatrous merit card before the Lord. And we lose our justification before God. The only thing that justifies us before the throne of God is the finished work of Christ on the cross of Calvary. Someone left the ministry and they asked him, why did you leave? He said, because they don't recognize me. I'm giving my money. I'm giving my service and nobody recognizes me. They do not commend me. They do not appreciate me enough. And he left and went to start his own ministry. And went to start his own church. That place is a cage. It's not a church. Because the foundation that gave birth to that church is not right. It is on the purpose of a merit card, not the mercy of Christ. And anytime you put your service as your merit card before God, you are practicing idolatry. Finally, the idolatrous practice we do in church today, that we do in the name of a church today, are the use of elements. What do I mean by elements? In that place we read, in, it said, now when Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Then look at that verse 22. It says, then Paul stood in the midst of Areopagos and said, men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects, the elements of your worship. The elements of your worship. And today, we have so elevated the element of worship above the God we are worshiping. Elements such as oil, communion, blood of sprinkling, water, mm, mantu, Salt, honey, 
soil or sand. Do you know that today, some people cannot go out freely with confidence and boldness in Christ if they do not have their so-called mantle tied to their car or put in their pockets. Some people will not go out with boldness if they have not put oil and anoint their head before going out in a day. Some people will not be confident to sleep in the night if they have not done blood of sprinkling around their houses. Those elements have replaced Christ in their heart. They now raise this element above Christ, above his name, above his word. And friends, permit me quickly to read to you Genesis 35, and then we'll pray. Genesis chapter 35, and I read verse 1, and I read to 7 very quickly. Genesis 35, verse 1 to 7. Glory to God forever. Mm. Hallelujah. Praise Jesus. He said, then he said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel. Bethel is the house of God. And dwell there. And make an altar there to God. Who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. So God is calling Jacob to his house. His presence. His abode. And God didn't say go there occasionally go and dwell there. So the house of God or the presence of God is where we are to tabernacle, is where we are to dwell, but not in the place that is a cage. And then there is a mystery that Jacob understood. That's number two. Jacob therefore said to his household and to all who were with him, Put away the foreign gods that are among you. Purify yourselves and change your garments. Then let us arise and go up to Bethel. And I will make an altar there to God, who answered me the day of my distress and has been with me the way which I have gone. I pray that the Lord will answer you in every hour of your distress and that the Lord will be with you in all your journeys through life in the name of Jesus Christ. So they gave Jacob all the foreign gods which were in their hands and the hearings which were in their ears and Jacob hid them under the terebim tree which was by Shechem. And they journeyed verse 5. And they journeyed. Now I like to Take you back a little bit to verse number two, and I will read it um, from the Amplified Translation. Let me read verse four from the Amplified Translation. It says, so they, both young men and women, gave to Jacob all the strange gods they had, and their hearings, which were worn as charms against evil, which were worn as charms against evil. So you see, we use the oil today, we use the mantle today, we use the the the. The, the, the communion today, like they were using these earrings as charms. We now use this element as charms against the evil of our days. And what we are practicing is idolatry. As long as God, the Christ in us, is not supreme and sufficient, and we have to add all these elements to it. But look at verse number five. They have now submitted these 
charms, these elements that are charms to ward of evil, they've submitted it. So it looks as if they were defenseless in the natural. But look at verse 5. And as they journeyed, the terror from God fell on the towns round about them. And they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. The message translation says, and a supernatural covering, a supernatural terror from God was upon Jacob and his family that the enemy could not touch them. Yet they submitted the element that we are their charms against evil. And today we've replaced Christ and the supernatural to natural physical elements that we can touch and see. We are invariably practicing Babalawism in the name of Christ and in the name of church. You see people tying a, an handkerchief, they are tying it on the, on the windshield of their car against evil. They are wearing a mantle around their hands as they are going for an interview. Why? Because a man of God that they respect so much have told them the mystery of the mantle, the mystery of the anointing oil, the mystery of the blood of sprinkling. And they have held on to these things above the Christ that is in them. So Jacob came to Luz, that is better, which is in the land of Canaan. He and all the people who were with him. And he built an altar there and called the place El Betel. Because there God appeared to him when he fled from the face of his brother. El Betel means God of Betel. God of his own house. And that's where I close. El Bethel. God of Bethel. Bethel means the house of God. But there is El Bethel. The God over the house of God. And if we will not practice idolatry in the name of church. God. The capital G-O-D. Must be God over that church. Must be God over that Bethel. If your pastor is the God over that church, then that is not El Bethel. If elements of oil of water, they are even they've even upgraded the water now to a swimming pool. If that is the God you see and you are holding on to, you are in a cage. If people and position is more sacred to you than God. Even if that building is more greater than the God of the building, you are in a cage and not in a church. El Bethel, God over his own house. Is God over that church you are attending? Is God over that church that you are pastoring? Is God over your life? over your family. Is God over that dream, that vision that you are pursuing? Is God over that message that you are preaching? It is time for us to return to the old path. God had to tell Jacob, go back to Bethel. Go back to Bethel. And Jacob had to collect all the idols that his people have held on to, and he buried it. Today I pray that God will perform a burial service for everything we have held on to outside of him in the name of church. That Christ alone will be exalted over his house. And that we will have again in our generation, hell, the hell, God over the house of God. Let us pray.
Eternal Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for this series and this teaching. Thank you, O oh God, that this teaching will bring about transformation of lives and destinies, of ministries and churches, that every one of us will truly return back to better, to meet El better, and to submit and surrender under his canopy, and that Christ alone will be exalted. Thank you, blessed Father. Glory be to your name. Save those who are not born again. Reveal your will and purpose and counsel to them. Draw them to yourself and make a name for yourself. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. I trust that this teaching has blessed you. I trust that this series has led something significant in your heart and in your life. Let us hear from you. Send us a mail. Send us a text message through our platforms. Visit our website and download this message and other videos from our YouTube page. And the Lord has blessed you. And you like to sow a seed. You like to give to this ministry. The account details are on the screen. So like, come your way again. Stay strong, stay safe, and remain blessed. We love you. God bless you. Bye-bye.